Hey friends, today we're going to have just an honest and real conversation about how I desexualize my brain and hopefully how you can do it too. The story begins for me at age 11. I got my first iPod. It was primarily given to me just so I could listen to podcasts and radio shows and that sort of thing. But inevitably, I got on YouTube and I love YouTube, especially at that point in my life and just began hopping around the Explore page and all sorts of things like that. And, you know, inevitably, as an 11 year old, I came across things that uh, made me feel a particular way that basically, you know, turned me on sexually. That was the what was going on. I didn't realize that at the time, but they were stirring something up in me sexually. And so I began to kind of like that. And I was like, what well, these thumbnails, whatever I'm coming across, they give me a good feeling. And that's basically how it begins, right? And so um, I came across these videos of these Super Bowl commercials, these hypersexualized Super Bowl commercials at like age 12, 11. And I just started watching them. And I, w I would watch them late at night or early in the morning. Uh, and I would really hide them. I'd feel really ashamed about it. It was the first time I was really like, oh man, I'm hiding this from my parents. I don't really know what God thinks about this, but it, I know he's not super pleased because I feel guilty about it. And this is something wrong, but it also feels good. And so this is kind of an interesting paradox here where as an 11 year old, you're figuring out, at least for me at, the, at that time, that something that feels really good can also make you feel bad. And that's just a weird kind of idea. What, what is that even about? Uh, from, for me, my story kind of progressed on from there. I had heard people talk about pornography. Like I said, I'd listened to radio shows like Wretched Radio or um, like different Christian podcasts. And, and so they were talking quite a bit from early on about pornography and the dangers of pornography. And for me, as like a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, I was like, okay, that stuff is not good. That stuff is really harmful and disgusting and, and, and you should stay away from that. Um, but anything else, you know, is kind of more acceptable. And that's kind of the, 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 the perspective that I took. For a long time, it was like, okay, I'm not going to advertise that I look this stuff up, but I'm also not as ashamed of it as, you know, almost like a holier than thou attitude. Like, no, I don't watch pornography. Um, I just watch YouTube. And so I began to kind of, especially as a young teenager, Try to look up stuff on YouTube. Try to look up, you know, words like, um, I type in like hot girls or something like that. It's like a 12 year old. And I laugh now because it's kind of dumb. But at the time, it's it, it shows that this was something that I wanted. Trying to find things on YouTube, trying to find things on, you know, Instagram without going too far like pornography. Like I promised myself I never watch pornography. I never I never go that far because God hates that and, and I wouldn't want to get caught up in that. And yet I was still on this path of lust and lust was really taking over my life at that point, my secret life and my thought life. Let me just explain this a little bit. When your brain is sexualized, like even if you're not watching pornography, okay, even if you're not, uh, the truth is, is that you can still see women specifically, you know, for, for me as a man, I'm seeing women as objects, as sexual objects and becoming distracted by them and their bodies. And some people might say, hey, Isaac, that's all natural, right? That's all natural. Uh, that's just, you know, the way we are as sexual beings. And maybe a degree of that, okay, I, I understand, like we are attracted to women, that's that's fine. But what we're consuming does play a, a, a part in in what we are thinking about and how we are processing different things that we're seeing in our life. And so, you know, hey, that was my story. I'm like watching these things on YouTube, trying to get further and further along the way without watching pornography, but trying to search up things and being really clever with what I'm searching up on YouTube. It was stupid because I had this belief about myself that I was better than other people because I wasn't watching pornography. And yet I was engaging in the exact same thought life as they were. I was engaging in the exact same sins as they were. It was taking up a lot of my time. It would be, hey, you know, I, I'm, I get to bed or Saturday night, late at night, I'm going to be watching this stuff because it makes me feel good. I think that's the crux of it is that when you understand that you're going to these things because usually it's because you don't feel super good about your life. Like that's the first thing that you kind of need to understand is that if you were in a, in a really good place, like a really good place emotionally and spiritually and circumstantially, you wouldn't be turning to these things because you'd be finding that satisfaction and that, that joy and that sense of, you know, happiness 
elsewhere as God designed it, right? Um, but when you don't have that, when things are going wrong in your life and you can tell yourself, man, these are the only things that are happening to me. My life sucks particularly like nobody, as if nobody else's life sucks. And then you use these things as coping mechanisms, basically, because the way I saw it, I, I dealt with a very heavy anxiety and a place of comfort where I didn't feel that anxiety was when I was watching this stuff, right? When I was, uh, you know, taking in this and it made me feel good. The truth was though, on the other side of that, it actually enhanced my anxiety. It enhanced my distaste for myself and my lack of self, my, my lack of self-confidence. And it was just kind of this repetitive cycle, but you don't realize that at the time you don't realize that as a kid, that's part of what's so sad about this and this is why it's so important I think for you to watch this right now is that as a kid as a young teenager you don't know what it's doing to you but it is doing things to you and you need to realize that so I would look at scripture verses I would look at okay you know hey if you look with lust you've already committed adultery with her in your heart and I knew that and I felt guilty about that and I knew that was my my struggle and at one point especially when I was um, specifically when I was 11 12 years old I went to my dad and I said, dad, um, I'm watching this stuff online and I know it's not right. I don't really know how to explain it, uh, but I want you to take my iPod for, from me during the night so I'm not tempted to watch this stuff. And I gave it to him. And that was part of my dad really developing a close relationship with me that I felt comfortable to do that with him. I knew I wasn't going to get reamed out. I knew that I wasn't going to get you know, punished or anything like that. It was just going to be... You know, son, let me just ask you some questions here. How does that make you feel? Um, you know, okay, I'm going to take this from you and, and that, that'll be all right. And that was, that was a good step. That was a good step, but it, it wasn't enough. One of the consistent things that I remember was each and every time I would watch something that I knew was sexually inappropriate, I would promise myself that I would never do it again. I would promise myself, Isaac, you're not doing this again. You're not doing this again. You know that this is empty. This doesn't fulfill me, f fulfill you. You know that this isn't right. And it's just garbage. And usually I would watch some Christian video about, um, you know, afterwards about lust and how awful it is. And, and you, you, you know, you're, you're doing these things, you're doing these terrible things and you need to stop and you need to just, you know, cling to the scripture and cling to God and be a man and not do this. And I would get really hyped up and I'd get really excited. I need to be a man. I need to be the man that God called me to be. And then the next day I would do the same thing. Looking back on what the rule was, obviously it's sin. But a lot of people stop at sin. A lot of people say it's sin. Just stop it, right? Just stop it. Um, if with any kind of sexual sin, they say, oh, it's sin. Stop it. Or any kind of sin in general, honestly, they're like, it's sin. Stop it. I understand where they're coming from. And I, I too are like, yeah, absolutely. You want to walk in holiness. But it's not helpful to just say, stop it. It's one thing if you're not trying to stop it, right? If you're not trying to stop, if you don't care that you're doing it, then you need to reevaluate your own heart. Do you really want to honor God? Are you really his child? But if you want to, and yet you keep falling into this, then knowing, then somebody saying, stop it, it it's not going to help you. And that's what I encountered a lot of it. I'd watch videos that would say, stop it. You need to be a man, be a Christian man, and, and just, and, and be courageous and own up to your, your sin and take responsibility for it. And I'd get really excited and really hyped up about it. But yet that wasn't really addressing the anxiety and the hopelessness that I felt in my heart. The fact that I felt that my life was so chaotic. And so I was so anxious about everything that, that the fact that I needed to understand that that's what I was looking to my peace. I, I was looking for peace in, I was looking for peace in these things. I want to retrain the, the way my brain thinks because I'm disgusted at the thoughts that I have. And I know it's sin, but yet I can't stop it. So what do you do? What, what do you do in that moment? Well, this is what I did, okay? You need to evaluate, understand, and cut out your triggers. I used to say just cut out your triggers, right? So understanding, hey, what is going to trigger you to go down this path of, uh, of sin, basically of sexual sin that you don't want to go down? The truth is cutting out your triggers is not enough because in order to try, uh, cut them out, you need to understand them. What I've noticed about a lot of things is that you are going to get triggered. That's the truth. You're going to get triggered. Trying to put yourself in a cocoon where you are never triggered is a losing battle. It's just a losing battle. The, the truth is you need to go into it understanding where your triggers are, what gets you, 
once you understand that, all of a sudden you are like, uh, you're like a movie character that acknowledges the cameras there. Like that's how I see it, right? You're, you're like, okay, I know I'm being triggered right now. So you can kind of step out of that circumstance and say, out of that, that particular situation and say, okay, hey, like this usually gets me. This is usually something that would tempt me. So you're understanding your triggers and you're understanding what thirst traps are. You're understanding that these things that people are creating that are either thumbnails, Instagram pictures, videos that are sexually charged, they're designed to attract you. They're designed to catch your attention. They're designed to captivate you. So when you realize that, it's kind of like, it's like realizing that junk, like junk food is bad for you. It's like when you realize that all the stuff is in the Doritos and you're like, the Doritos do, did taste good. Like maybe they do even taste good for a time. Then they make you feel sick. You eat too many of them or whatever. But then you're looking at the ingredients list and you're like, what is this red dye in 45? Like, you know, da, 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 like words that have, you know, a million letters in them. And you're like, what's going on? That's kind of how I see this, where you are now realizing how the thirst trap is made, that these people are after your money, they're after your attention, they're after after your heart to captivate your mind. So then you'll want more of it. So you'll buy what they're selling. So you'll crave what they have. That's just dumb. We're not going to fall for that. Now you're saying, Isaac, uh, I pretty much always fall for that. <laughs> and that's why we need to re- you know, desexualize our brain. We need to rewire the way that we think. I often think about this, training your taste, training your taste. And before I, before I get into that, I, I need to make kind of an overall comment here. God is the one that's going to deliver you from this. That's the truth. It is sin what you're doing. It is sin, right? There are roots to this, but God is the only one who's going to be able to navigate and dig up those roots in whatever areas those are, whether that's loneliness, whether that's pride or pleasure seeking or looking to other things for peace, like God's going to be the one that can get into that. So you have to invite them, him into this. And if you're not already a child of God, if you haven't repented and trusted in him for your life, if you haven't repented for your sin and trusted in him for your salvation, then you're missing out. All this stuff is just going to be empty. It really is. So he has to be the center. When I talk about training your taste, we go back to the junk food again. You think Doritos taste good. You're like, Doritos are the best thing ever because I eat them all the time. And, and yet your friends are like, oh, you're getting kind of chubby because he eats Doritos all the time. And you crave Doritos and you crave junk food and you crave all this stuff that is not good for you because that's what you eat. That's what you eat. But you ask somebody that has been off that stuff for a year, a couple of years, do they want it? No. Are they miserable? Uh, maybe somebody is, but I know a lot of people that aren't because they've trained their taste and their cravings to be directed at things that are good for them, that are going to nourish them. And this is what's amazing. Uh, you know, I was raised homeschooled and, uh, and what was so cool about it is some of the kids were so sheltered, right, uh, that they couldn't even, the idea of, of a, like even a woman in a bikini, okay? This might feel a little bit weird for you guys, but th this is the truth. A woman in the bikini wasn't attractive to them. Now, maybe it was, maybe in the behind the scenes, you're like, okay, well, a woman that doesn't have a lot of clothes on, like that's gonna be attractive for any boy or whatever. Okay, I, I get that. But would they want a woman like that? like that would uh, maybe post themselves online in scandalous clothing and, and that kind of thing. Were they attracted to that kind of woman? Um, no, they weren't. They weren't. Why is that? Why is that? And it's because the women that they were around were presenting themselves in a very different way. That the ideals and the values that were poured into them were different. So they were looking at different things as valuable, as attractive in a woman. A woman that could cook, a woman that could really care for children, a woman that could, you know, maybe run her own business or start selling something or being an entrepreneur or help out at church and, and care for the children at church or be just a, a, a person that is, uh, you know, a happy, joyful, exuberant person to be around. Like all these things were attractive qualities. It was not how much skin are they showing because that wasn't what they were fed. That wasn't what they were given. So they didn't find that attractive. Now you, you zoom out and maybe you've been 
that's not how your taste was trained. You got exposed to the to lust really early on. The kind of maybe it's pornography, maybe it's less. Either way, your brain was rewired in a particular way where you don't you, your your taste has been shifted. It has been manipulated where now somebody that is posting that kind of thing, they are attractive to you. You kind of do want them. But that's not good. That's not good because that's not going to be good for you. So what do you need to do? You need to retrain your taste. Going back to cutting out triggers, cut that out. Just cut that out of your consu- consuming diet, right? Yeah, I'm not going to watch that stuff. I'm not going to look at that stuff. I'm going to cut it all out. I'm going to understand my triggers to know when something like that comes out. I'll be prepared for it, but I'm not going to invite it in my life because I'm training myself. I'm training my taste to be attracted to something that is better for me. That might be a revolutionary thought for you guys, but it is the truth. As I think back to how I desexualized my brain, it wasn't really me doing it. it. You know, I took practical steps that really helped me and set me up on a path to success. One of the best things I ever did was accountability, talking to a buddy, talking to a sibling, talking to my dad about, you know, hey, can I be accountable in this way? Can you check up on me? And that was one of the best things for me. You can be accountable too with a service called Covenant Eyes. It will send a monthly kind of recap of your internet usage to somebody that cares for you and they can check up on you. And it puts that extra place of accountability where you're searching things up, you're looking on things, th- looking up things online and you're thinking, okay, well, my buddy's going to get this report at the end of the month. So maybe I'm not going to look at this. And sometimes that's all you need, right? So I have 30 days free for you that you can check it out. Link in my description. It is an affiliate link. So some of the kickback on it, if you do sign up, comes to the ministry and that really helps me out. People call them thirst traps for a reason. We are thirsty. The thing is, is that we don't know what we're thirsty for. Because you're always going back. You're going back and back and back and back. And if you know anything about sexual sin, it never satisfies you. And so you're you're consuming these thirst traps. You're consuming what you think is going to satisfy you, but it won't. And at the end of the day, we need to come to God just as the woman at the well came to Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, you know, this water, this will satisfy you. This is living water. You'll never need to drink again after you drink this. And it shocked her. And she went into the village proclaiming, this is the most Messiah. This is, this is the one that we've been waiting for. And we too can come to Jesus. And Jesus says, this is the water that you've been waiting for. All those things in your heart that you tried to satisfy, all the, the, the pain and the trauma that you tried to mend by taking part in this, it won't satisfy you. It won't heal you. It will make things worse. But there is time for redemption. There is time for forgiveness. And that time is now. And I want you to drink this living water so you can be satisfied. And I want you to walk with me as I heal you, as I help your brain, as I help your heart, as I teach you what it's like to be a disciple of mine, where you don't need to think the way you used to think and do the things you used to do. There is hope and there is forgiveness. And you can engage in healthy sexuality. That's the beautiful picture of of the Bible is that there is redemption, there is forgiveness, and then God is like, hey, I'm going to restore you and make you into a new creation. And that doesn't mean making you a, a non-sexual being. It, makes, it, it means making you a, a holy sexual being, a, a healthy sexual being, someone who can engage in sexuality in the context that it was designed in a marriage between a man and a woman. That is the beauty. That is a picture of the gospel of Christ and his church. That's a beautiful thing. And and that's what we're invited into. But we've been so, our culture has been distorted it so much that we almost, we can't even see what it was originally meant to be. It's like a diamond, honestly, that has been in the dirt for so long. And it just looks like a lump of coal. It just looks like a lump of coal. And we're saying, you know, some people in purity culture would like to say, just throw that thing out, throw that in the garbage. But we're saying, no, polish that thing off. Get all that dirt and that grime off. And the only way you can do that is through Christ, through Jesus. And you understand underneath is that there is healthy sexuality that we can engage in. This is a process, guys. You're not going to desexualize your brain in like a, a week. It's not going to be a month, maybe a couple of years. But you need to take these steps that are going to help you get there. 
and you need to invite God into it. A huge aspect of this to me is prayer because he gives you the strength to make these changes. He gives you the courage to do what's necessary to follow him, to honor him, because that should be the motivation. It shouldn't be, I want to do this to better my life necessarily, or just to be a better person. It should be, I'm not a good person, but I want to honor Christ and he's given his life for me. So I want to, I want to give this to him. I want to submit this at his feet. And that's, that's the calling. That's it. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe because I'm putting out new videos all the time. Be sure to sign up on Patreon today and you get access to all sorts of unique videos and Discord pages and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's an awesome place to be and you support Daily Disciple in doing it in my mission of equipping people to follow Jesus daily. So until next time, God bless.